Hi guys, so I was thinking about what I wanted to read to you. I was going to read part two of Harry's Mistake, but my Kindle isn't charged. So I was looking at all my shelves to find a chapter book. Um, and I was like, I'm just going to read the book of three because that's what I want to read. Um, so I'm going to read it to you guys. So it begins with chapter one, The Assistant Pig Keeper. Taryn wanted to make a sword, but Cole, charged with the practical side of his education, decided on horseshoes. And so it had been horseshoes all morning long. Taryn's arms ached and soot blackened his face. At last he dropped the hammer and turned to Cole, who was watching him critically. Why? cried Taryn. Why must it be horseshoes, as if we have any horses? Cole was stout and round, and his great bald head glowed bright pink. Lucky for the horses, was all he said, glancing at Taryn's handiwork. I could do better at making a sword, Taryn protested. I know I could. Before Cole could answer, he snatched the tongs and flung a strip of red-hot iron into the anvil and began hammering away as fast as he could. Wait, wait, Cole cried. That's not the way to go after it. Heedless of Cole, unable to even hear him over the din, Taryn pounded harder than ever. Sparks sprayed the air, but, more, but the more he pounded, the more the metal twisted and buckled, and finally the iron sprang from the tongs and fell to the ground. Taryn stared in dismay. With the tongs, he carefully bent, picked up the bent iron and examined it. Not quite the blade for a hero, Cole remarked. It's ruined, Taryn glumly agreed. It looks like a sick snake, he added ruefully. As I tried telling you, said Cole, you had it all wrong. You must hold the tongs so, so that when you strike, your flow must go from your shoulder and your wrist is loose. You can hear it when you do it right. There's a kind of music in it. Besides, he added, this is not the metal for making weapons. Cole returned the crooked, half-formed blade into the furnace where it lost its shape entirely. I wish I might have my own sword. Taryn sighed, and you could teach me sword fighting. Wished, cried Cole. Why should you want to know that? We have no battles at Cairdalden. We have no horses either, objected Taryn, but we're making horseshoes. Get on with you, said Cole, unmoved. That is for practice. And so this would be, Taryn urged. Come, teach me sword fighting. You must know the art. Cole's shining head glowed even brighter, and a trace of smile appeared on his face as if he were savoring something pleasant. True, he said quietly. I have held a sword once or twice in my day. Teach me now, he pleaded, and he seized a poker and brandished it, slashing through the air and dancing back and forth over the hard-packed earth. See, he called, I know most of it already. Hold your hand, chuckled Cole. If you were to come against me like that, with all your posing and bouncing, I should have you chopped to bits by this time. He hesitated a moment. Look you, he said quickly. At least you should know there's a right way and a wrong way to go about it. He picked up another poker. Here now, he ordered with a sooty wink. Stand like a man. Taryn brought up his poker and while Cole shouted instructions and set them to parrying and thrusting with much banging and clanking and commotion. For a moment, Taryn was sure he had the better of Cole, but the old man spun away with amazing lightness of foot. Now it was Taryn who strove desperately to ward off Cole's blows. Abruptly, Cole stopped. So did Taryn, his poker poised mid-air. In the doorway of the forge stood the tall, bent figure of Dalbin. Dalbin, master of care Dalbin, was 379 years old. His beard covered so much of his face he always seemed to be peering over a, gla a gray cloud. Ooh, it's early. On the little farm, where while Taryn and Cole saw to the plowing and sowing and weeding and reaping and all the other tasks of husbandry, Dalbin undertook the meditating, an occupation so exhausting he could only accomplish it by lying down with his eyes closed. He meditated an hour and a half following breakfast and again later in the day. The clatter from the forge had roused him from his morning meditation, and his robe hung askew over his knobby knees. Stop that nonsense directly said Dalbin. I'm surprised at you, he added, frowning at Cole. There's serious work to be done. It wasn't Cole, Taryn interrupted. It was I who asked to learn sword play. 
I did not say I was surprised at you, remarked Dalden, but perhaps I am, after all. I think you'd best come with me. Taryn followed the ancient man out of the forge, across the chicken run, and into the white thatched cottage. There, in Dalbin's chamber, moldering tomes overflowed with sagging shell overflowed the sagging shelves and spilled onto the floor amid heaps of iron cook pots, studded belts, harps with or without strings, and other oddments. Taryn took his place on the wooden bench as he always did when Dalbin was in a mood for giving lessons or reprimands. I fully understand, said Dalvin, setting himself behind the table. In the use of weapons, as in everything else, there is a certain skill. But wiser heads than yours will determine when you should learn it. I'm sorry, Taryn began. I should not have. I'm not angry, Dalvin said, raising a hand. Only a little sad. Time flies quickly, and things always happen sooner than one expects. And yet, he murmured, almost lost to himself, it troubles me. I fear the Horned King may have some part in this. The Horned King? asked Taryn. We shall speak of him later, said Dalbin, and he drew a ponderous leather-bound volume toward him, the Book of Three, from which he occasionally read to Taryn, and which, the boy believed, held in its pages everything anyone could possibly want to know. As I have explained to you before, Dalbin went on, and as you have very likely forgotten, Frydane is a land of many contraves, of small kingdoms and kings. And, of course, there are war leaders who command their warriors. And there is a high king above them all, said Taran, Math, son of Mathenway. His war leader is the mightiest hero in Frydane. You have told me of him. Prince Gwydion. Yes, Taran went on eagerly. I know. There are many things you do not know, Dalvin said. For obvious reasons, for the obvious reason that I have not told you. For the moment, I am less concerned with the realms of the living and the land. I am less concerned with the re mm. I am less concerned with the realms of the living than the land of the dead, with Anuvin. Taryn shuddered at the word. Even Dalbin had spoken it near whisper. With the king Aram, lord of Anuvin, Dalbin said. Know this, he continued quickly. Anuvin is more than a land of death. It is a treasure house, not only of gold and jewels, but of all things advantage of men. Long ago, the race of men owned these treasures by craft and deceit. Arwen stole them one by one with, for his own evil uses. Some few of the treasures have been wrested from him, though most lie hidden deep within Anuvin, where Aron guards them jealously. But Aron did not become ruler of Prydain, said Taran. You may be thankful he did not, said Dalbin. He would have ruled had it not been for the children of Dawn, the sons of Lady Dawn and her consort Belen, king of the sun. Long ago they voyaged to Prydain from the summer country, and they found the land rich and fair, though the race of men had little for themselves. The sons of Dawn built their stronghold at Cairdathel, far north in the Eagle Mountains. From there they helped regain at least a portion of what Aran had stolen, and stood as guardians against the lurking threat of Anuvin. I hate to think what would have happened if the Sons of Dawn hadn't come, said Taran. It was good destiny that brought them. I am not always sure, said Dalbin, with a wry smile. The men of Prydain came to rely on the strength of the House of Dawn, as a child clings to its mother. They do so even today. Math the High King is descended from the House of Dawn. So is Prince Gwydion. But that is all, by the way. Prydain has been at peace, as much as men can be peaceful, until now. What you do not know, Dalbin said, is this. It has reached my ears that a new and mighty warlord has risen. And as powerful as, as, powerful as Gwydion, some say more powerful. But he is a man of evil, for whom death is a black joy. He sports with death as you might sport with a dog. Who is he? cried Taran. Dalbin shook his head. No man knows his name, nor has any seen his face. He wears an antlered mask, and for this reason he is called the Horned King. His purposes I do not know. I suspect the hand of Aron, but in what manner I cannot tell. I tell you now for your own protection, Dalbin added. From what I saw this morning, your head is full of nonsense about feats of arms. 
Whatever notions you may have, I advise you to forget them immediately. There's unknown danger abroad, and you are barely on the threshold of manhood, and I have a certain responsibility to see that you reach it, preferably with a whole skin. So, you are not to leave Caer Dalbin under any circumstances, not even past the orchard, and certainly not into the forest, not for the time being. For the time being, Taryn burst out. I think it will always be for the time being, and it will always be vegetables and horseshoes for all of my life. Tut, said Dalbin. There are worse things. Do set yourself do you set yourself to be a glorious hero? Do you believe that it's all flashing swords and galloping about on horses? As for being glorious. What of Prince Gideon Gwydion? cried Taryn. Yes, I wish I might be like him. I fear, Dalbin said, that is entirely out of the question. But why? Taryn sprang to his feet. I know if I had a chance. Why? Dalbin interrupted. In some cases, he said, we learn more by looking for the answer to a question and not finding it than we do from learning the answer itself. If this is one of those cases. I could tell you why, but at the moment, it would only be more confusing. If you grow up with any kind of sense, which sometimes you make me doubt, you will very likely reach your own conclusions. They will probably be wrong, he added. However, since they will be yours, you will feel a little more satisfied with them. Taryn sank back and sat, gloomy and silent on the bench. Dalbin had already begun meditating again. His chin gradually came to rest on his collarbone, and his beard floated around his ears like a fog bank. He began peacefully snoring. The spring scent of apple blossom drifted through the open window. Beyond Dalbin's chamber, Taryn glimpsed the pale green fringe of the forest. Fields lay, ready to cultivate. They would soon turn golden with summer. The Book of Three lay closed on the table. Taryn had never been allowed to read from the volume for himself. Now he was sure it held more than Dalbin chose to tell him. In the sun-filled room, with Dalbin still meditating and showing no sign of stopping, Taryn rose and moved through the shimmering beams. From the forest came a monotonous tick of a beetle. He reached for the his hands reached for the cover, and Taryn gasped in pain and snatched them away. They smarted as if each of his fingers had been stung by hornets. He jumped back and stumbled against the bench and dropped to the floor, where he put his fingers woefully in his mouth. Dalbin blinked his eyes open, and he peered at Darren and yawned slowly. You had better see Cole about lotion for those hands, he said. Otherwise, I shouldn't be surprised if they blistered. Fingers smarting, the shame-faced Taryn hurried away from the cottage and found Cole near the vegetable garden. You have been at the Book of Three, Cole said. That is not hard to guess. Now you know better. Well, it was one of the three foundations of learning— See much, study much, suffer much. He led Taryn to the stable where the medicines for the livestock were kept and poured a concoction over Taryn's fingers. What, use is, what is the use of studying much when there's nothing to see at all, Taryn retorted. I think there is destiny laid on me that I am not to know anything interesting or do anything interesting. I'm certainly not to be anything. I'm not even at Care Dalvin. I'm not anything at Care Dalvin. Very well, said Cole. If that is all that troubles you, I shall make you something. From this moment on, you are Taryn, assistant pig keeper. You shall help me take care of Henwin. See her trough is full and carry her water and give her a good scrubbing every other day. That's what I do now, Taryn said bitterly. All the better, said Cole, for it makes things that much easier. If you want to be something with a name attached to it, I can't think of anything closer to hand. And it's not every lad who can be an assistant pig keeper to an oracular pig. Indeed, she's the only oracular pig in Prydane and the most valuable. Valuable to Dalbin, Taryn said. She never tells me anything. Did you think she would? replied Cole. With Henwin, you must know how to ask. Here, what is that? Cole shaded his eyes with his hand. A black buzzing cloud streaked through the, or the orchard and bore down so rapidly that it passed close to Cole's head that he had to leap out of the way. "'The bees!' Taryn shouted. "'They're swarming!' "'It is not their time!' cried Cole. "'Something is amiss!' The cloud rose high above them towards the sun, and an instant later Taryn heard a loud clucking and squawking from the chicken run. 
He turned to see that five hens and the roosters were beating their wings. Before it occurred to him they were attempting to fly, they too were aloft. Taren and Cole raced to the chicken run, too late to catch the fowls with the rooster leading. The chickens flapped awkwardly through the air and disappeared over the brow of the hill. From the stable a pair of oxen bellowed and rolled their eyes in terror. Dalbin's head poked out of the window. He looked irritated. It has become absolutely impossible for any kind of meditation whatsoever, he said, with a severe glance at Taryn. I have warned you once. Something has frightened the animals, Taryn protested. First the bees, then the chickens flew off. Dalbin's face turned grave. I have been given no knowledge of this, he said to Cole. We must ask Henwin about it immediately. We shall need the letter sticks. Quickly, help me find them. Cole moved hastily to the cottage door. Watch Henwin closely, he ordered Taryn. Do not let her out of your sight. Cole disappeared inside the cottage to search for Henwin's letter sticks, the long rods of ash wood carved with spells. Taryn was both frightened and excited. Dalbin, he knew, would consult Henwin on only a matter of greatest urgency. Within Taryn's memory, it had never happened before. He hurried to the pen. Henwin usually slept until noon. Then, trotting daintily, despite her size, she would move to a shady corner of her enclosure and settle comfortably for the rest of the day. The white pig was continually, was continually grunting and chuckling to herself, and whenever she saw Taryn, she would raise her wide cheeks so that he could scratch under her chin. But this time she paid no attention to him. Wheezing and whistling, Henwen was digging furiously in the soft earth at the far side of the pen, burrowing so rapidly that she would soon be out. Taryn shouted at her, but the clods continued flying at great rate. He swung himself over the fence. The oracular pig stopped and glanced around. As Taryn approached the hole, already sizable, Henwin hurried to the opposite side of the pen and started a new excavation. Taryn was strong and long-legged, but to his dismay he saw that Henwin moved faster than he. As soon as he chased her from the second hole, she turned quickly on her short legs and made for the first. By now, both were big enough for her head and shoulders. Taryn frantically began scraping the earth back into the burrow, but Henwin dug faster than a badger, her hind le legs planted firmly and her front legs plowing ahead. Taryn despaired of stopping her. He scrambled over the rails to jump to the spot where Henwin was about to emerge, planning to seize her and hang on until Dalbin and Cole arrived. But he underestimated Henwin's speed and strength. An explosion of dirt and pebbles, the pig burst forward from the fence, heaving Taryn into the air. He landed with the wind knocked out of him, and Henwin raced across the fields and into the woods. Taryn followed. Ahead, the forest rose up dark and threatening. He took a breath and plunged after her. That is the end of chapter one. Next time, we'll read chapter two, The Mask of the King. I always forget how much I love this book. Like, I know how much I love it. And then I start reading it, and I remember how much I love it again. Um, I'll see you next time. Until then, stay happy and stay safe, and I hope you're enjoying these stories. Goodbye!